Welcome to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. It was Victor Hugo who said that all the forces in the world are not so powerful as an idea whose time has come. In the US, inequality and collapsing capitalism means the idea of embracing a socialist politician is gathering momentum. The cynical stock response to how socialism can deliver on its economic promises is to ask, but how do you pay for it? We wanted to know how practical this new American dream really is. So we went to New York to speak with Bernie Sanders' economic advisor, Professor Stephanie Kelton. She advocates modern monetary theory as a way to fund vital public services and thinks the United States is now ready to embrace a socialist president. When um, you look at uh, America today from an economist's point of view, wh where do you place the country politically and economically? Impossible, I think, to, to place the country because we are so divided. We really are. There are issues around which you could say the country is here on Medicare for all, for example, on providing health care, guaranteeing health care as a right to all people. There is broad bipartisan support. Even among Republicans, you're at better than 50% in the polls when it comes to saying that we ought to be guaranteeing health care for everyone. So on specific issues, you can say the country is here, but in so many other ways, we're a deeply divided nation. If that is the case, as you look out from an economist's perspective, how did you get here? I think it's a, a slow build, right? I mean, I think in a lot of ways it starts around the time of Ronald Reagan, and that's when the, the unwinding begins. For generation after generation, families expected to do better than their parents did. And this, the so-called American dream was kind of alive and well. And then around the time of the early 1980s, things begin to change. And, and you pinpoint that time, would you, early 80s? Oh, uh, yeah. A lot more deregulation at that point, uh, private debt skyrockets. But, but you're saying that's the beginning of the unraveling. That's the beginning of the unraveling. It's when you begin openly attacking workers and unions and the social safety net that undergirds a civil society and turning government into not the potential solution to some of our problems, but as Ronald Reagan said, the government is, is your problem. And so this idea that you want small, limited government, governments are inefficient and bureaucratic and they don't do anything for you except get in your way and bog the economy down. And, um, and this is when inequality really begins to give back the decades of improvement since the Gilded Age. You know, we're, we're seeing diminished income and wealth inequality for a period of time, right up until about the 1980s, and then it just begins to widen again. And so where we are today is the culmination of a lot of things, tax policy, trade policy, our labor policies, antitrust. I mean, there are a lot of things that fed into that, and it took a while for tensions to bubble up to where you get people who say to Donald Trump, yeah, make America great again, fix it, make it like it was. And I think for a lot of people, make it like it was just means make it where I felt less anxious in life about my economic conditions. What was the philosophy in your view that drove that deregulation and drove that idea that big government bad, let's get all this red tape out of the way, let's be libertarian if you like, what was the philosophy that drove that? Well, it's the neoliberal idea that free unfettered markets are um, efficient when left to their own devices and anytime you observe problems in your economy, it's largely down to something the government has done wrong. It's over-regulated the market, it's overburdened it with rules and taxes and that sort of a thing, and that really the best thing that a government can do is to create the proper environment in which the entrepreneurs can thrive, the job creators. That whole narrative comes out of that, right? You get the government out of the way, markets are efficient, markets will solve problems, and what we want to do is just incentivize the really important people in the economy, right? The, the people who create the jobs. And so we created that narrative, that myth. And, and let those, quote, animal spirits run, because ultimately if they do well, everybody else does. Yeah, well. exactly. I mean, it, they didn't tell us that it was trickle down, but that became the term that people used uh, with derision to say, look, this is just a way to justify giving huge windfall gains to the people at the very top on the grounds that they're the most meritorious of all and that if we do right by them, 
then they'll do right by the rest of us. So recently Ray Dalio coming out, uh, one of your billionaires over here, and saying actually there's a structural problem within this economy. Uh, capitalism doesn't need to be thrown out totally, but it needs total recalibration. Advocating wealth taxes, etc. Uh, that's not a surprise to you? I mean, it's a surprise in a sense that someone in his position is willing to kind of boldly say, listen, the pitchforks are coming. And that's basically what he's saying. He's not saying we have to you know, eliminate inequality altogether, but he's saying the levels of income and more importantly wealth inequality have grown to such extremes that this is no longer sustainable and it will end badly and the way that he describes you know the potential bursting of the dam if something's not done is civil unrest and a very very ugly future. He um, and he's a probabilities man gives it a 60-40 chance 60% uh, it'll end badly, 40 it won't, he might adjust it a little. Where do you stand on the probabilities of that? Because ultimately, as an economist, and your work is offering a new alternatives, because what we don't want, of course, is violent revolution. In a lot of ways, I feel like climate is going to force the action here. And I don't think that maybe we would get there without the impending threat of climate change pushing us. You know, if we were just to watch the Gini coefficient continue to rise and we say, well, inequality is getting worse and worse year after year, I don't know how long it would take before you get the kind of violent unrest that Dalio imagines. But I think with climate, that creates the tailwind that's going to push people to the streets and to take action in ways that say, it's absolutely intolerable. If I see people who are not behaving in ways that are sensitive to climate and the urgency, you know, with which we need to be taking this, then I'm going to, you know, flip cars over. I don't know. I mean, I can imagine that sort of unrest. Which is the Gilets jaunes, for instance, in Paris, exactly. and one of their central tenets is the environment. Just back to Dalio quickly, he um, talks about not redistribution in a sense, he talks about redistribution of opportunity, he's quite firm on that. As an economist, that's ultimately what you're doing, uh, talking about creating the conditions, if you like, for, for that opportunity. When it comes to the climate debate, uh, is it the case that what you're looking at are new industries and creating those opportunities in new industries with monetary and fiscal policy? I think that can be part of the solution, but I think you know it's important to not oversell the degree to which we can rely on just you know incentivizing people to act and creating so-called opportunities ladders of opportunities because you know at the end of the day all of the training and improvements in education i mean these are the kinds of things he talks about right we need to make sure that that schools are better funded that people have a chance to get ahead but if at the end of the day there's not an economy into which young people can graduate and find good paying jobs then all you're doing is competing for the small pool of jobs that exist, but you're going to have different people who are unemployed. And so I think he's identifying a structural problem, and it's going to take structural solutions. And so some of the things that I think economists and policymakers have to think about are ways to institutionalize new safeguards and protections and ways for people to gain entry into the economy. It's not enough just to say, we'll help educate you so that you can find employment. We may just have to, I think we do, have to directly create those job opportunities for people. So where's the imagination for this? Because, you know, we might, we can talk about all the technical aspects, but when you really think about it, you have to be able to sell this vision, do you not? And the political class certainly have to do it. What, uh, if you were to, I've given you a blank piece of paper, you can sketch out an economy fit for our times. What does it look like? I would have a ball with that assignment because I would sketch out before and after pictures. And that's what I think we have to do. It's You have to help people see the world as it could be relative to the way it is today. Right. You know, look at our communities. The, the idea that there's not enough work that needs to be done improving everything from preparing for a Green New Deal, shoring up our coastal regions, preparing for wildfires and floods and, um, you know, urban communities that are blighted, schoolyards that are, show people what we're tolerating today and then fold the page over and show them what it could be. So it's the classic, on the house renovation shows, is the classic it's before it, and after. That's exactly how I would do that's it. That's how you'd picture it. I would, I would okay. do it exactly What does like before that. look like at the moment? I think we know, I think we've because we can see all the social problems out there. Um, and also the fact that Wall Street has devoured Main Street in this country, from, from what I can see. What does the new vision look like? It's a vision of people who are living in an economy that 
has broadly shared prosperity, where it's working for everyone and not just a handful of people at the very top. So in the richest country in the world, why do we have you know millions of kids living in poverty? Why do we have people in elder care facilities lying in a bed in a dark room alone when we could have somebody sitting there holding their hand, playing checkers, reading to them? We can invest in so many ways in this economy. And I think it's just as simple as showing people the small changes that can have meaningful, impactful. And is it that simple? Because when you talk about neoliberalism being the philosophy that drove Reagan right the way through till now, which has left us with this absolute train wreck of an economy, won't people say to you, well, OK, it's great, Stephanie, you showed me a before and after, and you have these old people. You know, there's a lot of cynicism around this. But they say, what's the philosophy here? What are we doing here? Why are we doing this? What's, what's driving your economics? Because what happens very quickly is the socialism word. Oh, that's just socialism. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm prepared to say that what we've done is um, collectively across the world, we have obsessed with budget outcomes. And that has been the driver of public policy. Where is the budget outcome? Is it in deficit? Is it in a big deficit? Is it in a little deficit? Can we put it in a smaller deficit? We have to reorient our focus and get back toward human outcomes. Those are the outcomes that matter. It isn't the budget outcome we should be obsessing over. It's do we have a broadly balanced economy? And what does that look like? I'm done balancing the budget. Nobody needs to obsess about governments balancing their budgets. This is not a, a hallmark of success. The hallmark of su success is show me a balance economy? Are people broadly sharing in the prosperity? Is all of the income and wealth going to people at the very top and everybody else is falling farther and farther behind? That is not a, a measure of success and those policymakers should not be championing their success in shrinking the budget deficit while they've wrecked their economies in the process. You're forcing your economy to balance the budget instead of using your budget to deliver a broadly uh, prosperous economy. talk about budget deficits in a very different way to uh, a lot of uh, people and people certainly in the media. The right, however we want to define them, but we hear that question all the time from the right wing journalist. How are you going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. You fleshed out this wonderful vision for the economy. We had the before and the after. We say, Stephanie, yep, we're in. We are subscribed to this. And then that person comes along and says, how are you going to pay for it? If we're talking about the federal government, if we're talking about the United States or the UK, the answer is in the simplest possible terms that in our case Congress, in your case Parliament, will approve a budget and that will trigger the release of the funds. What happens is that the House and the Senate, this is the way it's supposed to work, come up with a budget. And then if the two budgets don't look identical, they reconcile them. So they put them together and they say, this is the budget that we want to put forward to a vote. If Congress votes for that budget, in a sense, that budget has been financed. It has received the authorization, and Congress has committed to spending certain dollars in the areas that they said education, transportation, and so forth. So what happens is Congress has given its bank, the Federal Reserve, the instruction to begin making credits to seller's bank accounts. So if the US government commits to buying a bunch of fighter jets or other military equipment from Lockheed Martin or Boeing or whomever, then what the Fed does is credit the bank account of Lockheed Martin or Boeing on behalf of the federal government. In other words, the United States government has control of its own currency. It issues the US dollar. And when it spends, it spends more dollars into the economy. And that's, the bottom line is, that's the way the government already pays for everything. They pay by spending their currency into the economy. When we talk about this economic policy, ultimately we, we can't uh, talk about it without saying MMT. Just give us your definition of modern monetary theory. Well, I don't know that I have a definition, but MMT is sort of in the background of my mind as a analytical framework, as a lens through which I understand both the working of the US economy and the limitations in terms of what governments can do when they have monetary systems that look more like ours and when they have monetary systems that look a lot less like ours. So in the case of countries that currently use the euro, that's a very different monetary system. And countries that are operating under the EMU don't have the degree of fiscal space, can't use their budgets to the 
fullest possible as we can here in the U.S. So and just tell us why those two things are different. Yeah, because in the case of the U.S., the U.S. government retains control of its currency. So it is the issuer of the U.S. dollar. So if Congress authorizes payments and those payments are to be carried out in the central bank will clear the payments in its own currency, then we've got fiscal space opened up, policy space available. Whereas Italy, for example, can say, and just recently did, put forward a budget and say, we want to spend in these ways and have the European Commission say, oh, no, no, and just deny them the right to exercise their own discretion with respect to their budget. What's the one thing about MMT? as a movement and um, as an idea that gives you some reservation? I will say there are two. One is that we won't get there fast enough in terms of recognizing the policy space that we have to fund big ambitious investments that are absolutely needed with respect to climate change, that we're not going to figure it out soon enough and we're going to continue to behave as if we're on a gold standard and we have to worry about the budget outcomes and all that. And the other is that the first people to pick it up and really run with it are going to have very different ideas about who ought to benefit from the insights that MMT brings. In other words, it's just used to justify another round of tax cuts that look like the last round and that we end up doing things that exacerbate rather than tackle the income and wealth inequality. You make a clear differentiation between public and private debt. You're not so worried uh, about public debt, government debt, because of the issuance of your own currency. How worried are you about private debt? in the US? I mean, I worry about it, I think about it, I look at certain things like, let's say, student loan debt, where you've got about 44 million Americans who are currently saddled with a little over one and a half trillion dollars in outstanding student loan debt. That's something that I've looked at pretty closely that concerns me. In the aggregate, the private sector has managed to delever its balance sheet to improve its debt relative to its income since the financial crisis. But, you know, those debt loads continue to build back up. And, and at the end of the day, there are essentially three ways to get growth out of your economy. You know, one is the public sector can drive it. It could be driven by the rest of the world, could come through net exports. In the case of the U.S., that's not going to be the driver of growth for us. So that leaves one alternative, and that's private sector. And if private sector incomes are growing and spending is being largely driven by increases in wages and income, then that's fine. But if that private sector spending is mostly happening because people are taking more and more debt, then you know at some point that will come to an end. So it's that balance between public and private debt that I keep an eye on. Could you use modern monetary theory uh, to raise the cash necessary to pay down, for instance, that trillion dollars of student debt? Yeah, so if you took somebody who's got a student loan debt of fifty, a hundred thousand dollars and you said to them, you know what, from this point forward that debt is cancelled, you find other things to do with that three or five or seven or whatever hundred dollars a month. Now that person's in a position to, they've got part of the debt gone, so their wealth is automatically increased, their net worth goes up, now they've got some free cash flow, maybe they start building up savings. We have a terrible crisis in this country. People are nowhere near prepared for retirement, young people aren't saving, the young people who have student loan debt are really struggling, they don't have money for a down payment on a house and so forth. So yeah, you could definitely think in those terms. If we make that clear um, distinction between public and private debt, with MMT specifically, this school of thought, how do they sit together? MMT is not hostile to the idea of private credit or of banks extending loans um, to allow businesses to borrow to invest or people to borrow to buy homes or whatever the case may be. So private credit is fine. The trick is they got to be able to service the loans or the lender is going to face people who are defaulting on their loans and then it becomes a loss for the bank and so forth. So you're going to get broader problems in your financial system if people aren't able to service their debt. So this is just a very Minskian sort of way of thinking. The, th the thing is, you've got balance sheets, right? The private sector's balance sheet and the public sector's balance sheet, and they're interdependent in many ways. And so when you think about government deficits becoming surpluses 
to some other part of the economy, then government deficits are a way that the federal government channels dollars, if you like, into the rest of the economy. And those dollars then become the income through which people can save or spend, pay service debts and so forth. So there's an important link between public debt and private debt. And public debt is the asset of the non-government sector. It also generates income because the interest on that debt becomes interest income to bondholders. Government deficits themselves provide net financial assets, dollars to the the rest of the economy. So if the government is depriving people of dollars by reducing deficits, balancing budgets, or even moving into surplus, then it can create a financial strain in the rest of the economy. And that's really what happened during the Clinton years, right? That was much celebrated by Democrats uh, at the time because the government's budget moved into surplus. This was the first time in a couple of generations that the federal government's budget was in surplus. And people looked at that and said, this is a great accomplishment. Right? The government's now doing the right thing. But government surpluses are effectively sucking dollars out of the economy. And so what happened is the government's budget moved into surplus and the private sector's budget moved deeply into deficit. And so it's that interplay between the two. When the government's deficits get too small, it denies the rest of the economy and the private sector of those dollars. Let's actually think at the scale we talk about an entire economy. Let's divide it into and call it the private sector and the government sector and see what actually is involved if the government's going to run a surplus. Now for it to run a surplus, it has to tax you more than it spends on you. Let's say it's a 50 billion pound surplus, then that means they're taking 50 billion pounds out of circulation. So that's money out of the economy. Which can also mean if the money turns over twice a year, that can reduce total spending by 100 billion pounds. Right. So you've actually reduced GDP and reduced the amount of money in circulation. So when that money is taken out, where does the private economy go to, to make up the shortfall? Well, what they've done, they've gone to the banks and they've borrowed from the banks, either households or firms. And if you just borrow and simply keep it constant, then you have a 50 billion increase in your money from the bank credit, which you can spend. But that credit causes an increase in the level of debt you owe. What sort of debt? Private debt. Right. And this is what's exploded, and this is what's caused the financial crisis, and that's what's caused the current slope, slump in the economy. To actually have a monetary economy, your money factories have to be producing more money for us to spend. We have so what, so how do, what's the element that's missing in here? What we're listing out is the government is the only institution that owns its own bank, the central bank. And the central bank finances what the government wants to do, yeah. and can finance it indefinitely so long as we continue accepting British pounds as forms of payment within Britain, which we do. So if the government runs a, runs a deficit, it's actually injecting money into the economy. And unlike money coming from the banking sector, it doesn't come with an obligation to repay. It comes with an obligation to pay tax, but not to pay it all back. Government is one of our two money factories. The government running a surplus is the government destroying money and telling us to grow at the same time. To relate this to the UK, we had a, a financial crisis. A Tory government then imposed austerity, which is taking more money out of the economy than putting in. When you look at that situation and think about the economic thought behind it, the then Chancellor George Osborne, what would you have advised at that time? Spend? Keep spending? Yeah, absolutely. A combination of tax cuts or spending increases or some of the two, you needed to relax fiscal policy, not tighten it. It's exactly the opposite of what needed to be done. And, you know, here in the U.S., budget deficits exceeded 10 percent of GDP. And it's jarring because there are numbers that we're not accustomed to. We're used to seeing the budget deficit, you know, two and a half, three percent of GDP, something like that. All of a sudden, you know, it triples. And there's a moment of panic that sets in because somehow it doesn't feel right and people begin to draw the conclusion that this is something that you need to actively manage, that you need to start cutting spending, raising taxes and push that deficit down without remembering that if you're trying to push the government's deficit down like this, then by definition you're taking the non-government surplus and squeezing it down like this, so you're crushing your private sector. Which is the classic trick of uh, calling the government budget a household budget. Yeah, exactly. Which is what George Osborne did very well. And then his successor, but a future then Prime Minister, Theresa May, said, but there is no magic money tree. You're saying there is a magic money tree, and that's really the point of all this, isn't it? I mean, it's not magic. It's just the way it works. It's just the nature of the monetary system we have today is one that is not tied to gold or any other commodity. 
The government, in our case and in your case, has a floating currency, a sovereign currency, and your government can authorize payments in that currency, and those payments will be made, and there is no risk of running out of money, of defaulting. Same goes for the United States of America. We're not like a household. Our government is not like a household. Your government is not like a household. The, the dangers and problems arise when they behave as if they are. When they start trying to play by the same rules that apply to the rest of us, that's when you wreck your economy. Currency volatility, does it go hand in hand with implementing modern monetary theory? No. Why? Well, because you're talking about implementing modern monetary theory, I guess what we mean is recognizing that we have the fiscal space, that we have the policy space to run our economy at full employment. That's what MMT... That's quite a statement, isn't it? Especially on the wave of automation that's coming. Full employment, that's a, quite a thing to achieve. Look, there are plenty of studies out there. Larry Michelle and the Economic Policy Institute will have a lot of research that will um, challenge the premise that the robots are coming, AI is going to take all the jobs, and, and we're going to have this big problem. So put that aside, all though. Right. Can the U.S. ensure full employment domestically, even if that happens, even if the robots are coming. Can they? And, well, can yes, it? they can. Yeah, sure, because what would it take? So if the federal government said tomorrow, if we woke up and we said, we're going to do what FDR wanted to do back in the 40s, we're going to have a second bill of economic rights, and the first right afforded to everyone in this country is the right to employment, and we're going to make sure that that happens. If you want to work and you can't find work anywhere else in the economy, the government can guarantee that there is employment available to you, right? And how do they do that? Because the wage that they're offering to pay is in U.S. dollars. So the government, what it does is, it uses an elastic currency. This is the language of The Economist. It uses an elastic currency to create an elastic demand for labor. So anyone who wants work and can't find it can walk in the door unemployed and walk out the door with a job. Bernie Sanders, a uh, colleague of yours, is um, running uh, in 2020. And what comes with him is a huge amount of hope, which is a little different to some of the other candidates. Yeah, he comes with this message, as you say, of hope, but it's not, in a sense, a false hope. I mean, he, he always says, this is going to be hard. I can't just come in and no president, he always says, no president can deliver on an ambitious agenda of the kind that we're talking about. It's going to take all of us and it's going to be a fight and it's going to be opposed by very powerful interests if we're talking about Medicare for all or employment for all or Green New Deal, you know, the fossil fuel industry, pharma. It ain't going to be easy uh, is what he would say. But, you know, he's prepared to stand up and fight and I think millions of people are prepared to fight with him. Stephanie Carlson, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.